Um, right, I'll, I'll whip through this as quick as I can. So save your questions till later. I'll hang around a bit afterwards, so just pull me up. Down arrow. Fish used to be abundant, used to be sh lots of them. And we all know that. We've seen the photos, it wasn't that long ago. In 50 or 60 years, it's already dropped. So think about what it'll be like in another 50 or 60 years if we don't do something about it. And previous speakers have pointed out you guys are a bit of a silent army, or you could be, and that's kind of where I want to head. We'll start with talking about what fish need. You guys know how to catch them. You probably know basically what they need. I'll probably throw a few extra points in there, join a few dots. It's pretty simple, they need somewhere to live. I'll put that one first because that's what Ozfish is particularly good at focusing on. So habitat, they need to eat, they need to breed, otherwise they'll disappear, and they need to move around. The, the nerd word for that is connectivity. So you've got to connect rivers or bits of rivers or wetlands with rivers, whether that's by putting fish ladders in. That one doesn't work very well down here, by the way. Election coming up, write a letter. Um, whether you're putting flows down rivers to get fish from one point to the other to attract them around uh, or connect wetlands where they need to be. In terms of habitat, we'll start with that one. Habitat is critically linked to flow. You're going to hear flow and flow variability a lot when I talk because that's my thing. And as Stu pointed out, it'll complement or the habitat stuff will complement better flows. Most of you guys know, and you ladies, that Murray Cod in this part of the world tend to be in the faster flowing water around the logs. The two bits of habitat there are the logs and the faster flowing water. They do live in dams and impoundments where we stock them and some big lakes, but they tend not to breed very well in those places because of flow, you know, not enough food, basically. Yellow belly, they also like fast flowing water, but you'll find them in lakes and wetlands. In fact, the little ones need will go a lot better in wetlands that have recently filled up. Bony herring are everywhere, they're pelican food, but they're also Murray cod food. They're generalist. Then you get these weird things that like either salty patches like Murray hardy head or pygmy perch or purple spotted gudgeon, which Bugsy helped us put some over here in these lakes. Um, they need slow flowing water or backwaters or billabongs with lots of plants, which you don't get many anymore because they're full of carp. So, Different habitats, all dependent on a different type of flow, whether it's to put water in there or to maintain the dynamics. Food, again, flow variability. This nerd word productivity just means how productive an ecosystem or a river is. And it's based on floods and droughts or wet and dry cycles. So when a wetland goes dry or the riverbanks are partly dry and the dirt cracks, just imagine that's a million stock cubes. When it's wet, the nutrients come out, like when you put a stock cube in the water, and there's billions of little plankton eggs in that dry dirt, dormant. It gets wet, out they pop. Plankton, these guys, the same stuff whales eat, but freshwater versions. And then macroinvertebrates or small water bugs eat them, little fish eat them, particularly little yellows, little silvers, little cod. If you don't have the wetting and drying, you're not replenishing the food, these guys won't survive. You won't have fish to hunt in another. 10 or 20 years, not as many as you'd, you'd hope for. And then movement, there's that word connectivity. This apple is squeezing all my slides, but that's all right. Everybody knows since they're a kid that fish in the Northern Hemisphere migrate and move upstream. Owls do the same thing. First Nations people knew it tens of thousands of years ago. Barora and fish traps, 26,000 years old at least. The pyramids in Egypt are about five or 6,000, so that's far older, well constructed, maintained and built to catch fish moving upstream in response to flow. So fish won't move around if they don't get the flow. And our cages on the fish traps or the fish ladders around tell us you get the right flows. Silver perch threatened species moving on mass. If we get it right, our fish can move where they want to go. So when you hear about fish passage or fish ladders, it's to allow this to happen. There's meant to be arrows there, a circle. Fish breed, all of our native fish lay eggs. Eggs hatch to larvae, which are tiny, millimetres. They grow if they have enough food into eventually big fish, which we call recruitment, a nerd word. It just means you've got a new generation. We want to see this cycle going every year or two for our larger bodied species, every year, sometimes twice in a year for little guys that are important. I'm going to focus on the ones that most of us care about most, the big guys. We call Murray Cod a riverine specialist. I've already said they like that flowing water. You'll get more Murray Cod 
in the Lower Darling or the Mullaroo Creek than you will right here because this isn't flowing very fast. Their young need flow to disperse. So Dad will sit on the eggs in a nest under a log or a rock for a couple of weeks, but when the eggs hatch to the larvae, they'll need to hit the flow and move downstream and hopefully find somewhere where they can feed. And the little ones, as I said, need plankton. Yellow belly are a bit different. Callop, golden perch, whatever you name them. We call them a flow pulse specialist. They will not breed like a cod will every year. These guys won't breed unless they get a flow cue, so a rise in flow at the right time of year when it's warm enough, which in this part of the world is most of the year, not winter. Uh, and they, def they just broadcast. There's no nest. They just spit the eggs out. The males spit out the fertiliser, sperm, and those baby those eggs will be fertilised and start drifting downstream sometimes for weeks. And the adults then throughout the rest of their life have to move back upstream to counter that fish passage, fish movement. You've got to let them get back up. That fish way doesn't work, just a reminder. <laughs> <laughs> the darling fish are critically important to the Murray. So the Murray is a series of weirs from here down to the mouth. And then you've got a couple more upstream. Flowing water between Turumbri and Euston. Silver perch still breed and recruit there most years. Golden perch breed every year in the Murray when they get a flow queue. They just don't recruit. They're not surviving in big numbers. However, when the darling is on, goodness. A flow event in the, in the tributaries are up the Barwon Darling. Queue golden perch to spawn. Millions of eggs drift downstream. If they land in the Menindi Lakes or a Billabong, Taliwalker Creek, perfect kindergarten for little fish. Shallow, warm. Not a lot of big things, dirty water, the birds can't get you. A lot of food, a lot of plankton in those lakes that are just filled up. It is kindergarten for golden perch en masse and then the next time there's a flow, connects those lakes, out they come. They're now this big, or this big, and hopefully some of them come down to us. So the Anna Branch flowing is fantastic. That's bringing fish down to us from Lake Condilla. Environmental flows or unregulated flows or operational flows from the Menindi Lakes bring them out down to us. This is all in a poster that you can have a look at later that I got a friend of mine to draw up. Captured cod and yellow belly breeding life history in one picture. And you can ask me about it later. But we've known from pulling the ear bones out of dead fish, you can age them, they've got rings like a tree. You can also look at the chemistry and if that fish has moved from one river to another, you can see it in the chemistry. It's a different chemical makeup. Most of the yellow belly in the Murray are still fish from 2011 and 12 in the floods that began life in the Darling above Menindi. We're just not getting them in the Murray. It's broken for yellow belly recruitment. And again, they come down the Darling into the Murray as little fish or juveniles and then start moving upstream throughout their life. That fish ladder doesn't work. <laughs> so why are fish declining? What are the main reasons? Obvious ones, water quality, black water, blue-green algae, lack of water, so the water turns too hot or nasty like Menindi. Um, we can try and address some of those, but some of those are a product of the way we run rivers now, so we've got a long way to go. Habitat loss, Bugsy's now got control of this bulldozer and we're fixing that, put the snags back in. Barriers to movement, big ones, little ones, whatever. That's a bunch of dead fish that some, um, some person pulled out of a drum net and filled it on the side of the river. Exploitation, it's not so bad, it's not a big issue, but it's still there and it reflects on us as wreck fishers. Pest fish, we could go all night about that on its own. Lobby your local member to get behind pest fish management. The three big ones I want to talk about are grouped as river regulation. Big storage dams like Hume, flow regulation like this weir, or the one at Euston, or the 11 downstream of here, and extraction. Together, they are river regulation and use of water for productive use. They're not going away. They're part of what we deal with. We just have to find a way to minimise their impact. If you imagine the, the Southern Murray-Darling Basin schematically, you've got the Lachlan, the Bidgee, the Murray, the Goulburn, the Darling coming in. It's got headwater dams all over it. Black lines are weirs all over it. Red lines are pipes or channels taking water away for productive use in areas such as Sunraysia, which we need. But we have to find a balance. That's a vastly modified system for fish which evolved over 20 or 30 million years. This is 100 years. You can't adapt that quick. Oh, that's not going to work. It's flipped it in a nutshell. 
twist that 90 degrees. This is the river hide at Lockwood at Blanchetown from 1886 whoosh, whoosh, to 1973. The water level at Blanchetown. And you can see here the weir, Lock One was built. You no longer have downstream or, or low flows below the pool height. Mildura would look very similar. Uh, so rather than having a heartbeat every year, you're getting a flat line sometimes with the heartbeat going up but not coming down. And then more recently, well, the 60s and 70s, long ago, you started to get these big gaps appearing between the major peaks, reduced flooding, reduced flood frequency. The heartbeat is disappearing. Why does that matter? Fish like flowing water. We've talked about it. Fish need floods. It brings all the goodies in. The bloke in his shack downstream, he'll get better fishing if he has a flood. I promise him. If you don't have floods regularly, then all the leaves and the grasses and the crops that build up in the dry periods over multiple years will dissolve in the water when there is a flood we can't control. We call it black water because it's like tea, it's colour coming out of tea leaves. If you don't get a flood every year, which is akin to putting a tea bag in every year of, in a cup of water, you save them all up for 10 years, you get a flood, you might as well tip the whole box in the teacup and you know you will get blacker water. The black itself is great. It's carbon dissolving. It's the start of the food chain. Too much of it, bacteria, which are just up the food chain, multiply like crazy to process it and suck all the oxygen out in the process we get dead fish, right? And if we were to make that water hot water by having a flow in summer rather than spring or winter, which is when the Murray traditionally flooded, you're gonna have tea bags in hot water as opposed to cold. Probably don't need to harp on there. Guess when we have most of our high flows? Summer, because the storage dams capture the spring melt, the snow melt, the spring flight rain. So they're full. If you get more rain in summer, it's coming down. So our floods now happen when the water's hot, not lukewarm. Uh, moving on to weirs, which are great because we can park houseboats around them. We can have lovely vistas like this. We can water ski. I don't want to get rid of any of that. But it is worth noting that if a river is a flowing thing with snags and rocks and dynamic flow around the rocks and the snags, outside bends, inside bends, each of those is a different niche, a different habitat for different fish or different ages of fish. You put a weir in, you just get a big pool of water stretching for 30 or 40 kilometres upstream that moves very slowly. There's not a lot of dynamics in it. Carp love it, algae love it, because it's not flowing and mixing. Our natives don't like it, particularly when it's hot, because things can go wrong. That's moored on the Murrumbidgee and the other two are Menindi fish kills, which I dealt with quite a lot and I'm still scarred by it. This is a result, this happened in, a, in the weir pool, not in the flowing river downstream. Ultimately fish died there as well, but the mass fish kills happen in a weir pool. So regulation is, has its downs as well as its ups. And I mentioned the darling. This is how the darling used to flow every year, back in the 40s and 50s, 1940s. The red line, it's over bank, if it's above the red line. The lakes were modified to store water here. And then you can see we start to get these periods where you don't have overbanking every year. You actually get periods where you get no overbanking. And then fast forward to the last 20 years, you get these long periods where you might get a blip and people go, oh, I nearly got a flood. Yep, you had a flat river, barely knee deep either side of it. And you have rivers drying right up, which bugs in his crew and rescued a heap of fish for us and put them in places where there was more water because fish were dying. That's an impact of regulation, water storage, extraction. The balance is not right. We can do better. So what happens next? And this is the bit where you guys can come in. You don't have to just focus on your patch. Bugsy covers a big area. He covers the whole basin. You can help out elsewhere if you want. Um, you are a silent army. You pay fees for your licence and then you get upset if there aren't enough fish to catch. We'll kind of learn why there's not enough fish to catch and make sure it doesn't happen to your kids. And then put pressure on policy makers and so forth to try and fix it. Get behind things. Environmental water gets labelled as a greenie thing. If you're not a greenie, that's fine, but you can still enjoy environmental water 
which is bringing golden perch from the Menindee Lakes down here to you so you can catch them for the next 10 years. Just because someone's saying bloody greenies, don't dismiss it. You can get behind those things. There are positives. Do your own research, ask Bugsy, ask me, and then tell your mates. Pest fish, we're not going to go there tonight because it's too big and ugly. I'm happy to talk about it over a beer. Uh, and help those who are trying to help fish. Help Braden, help Jonathan, help me. If you see someone talking about fish and they sound like they might know what they're talking about, ask questions, go and tell your mates. And when people say dumb stuff that you think sounds like dumb stuff and it is dumb stuff and you've found out that it is really dumb, tell them. Politely tell them, hey, look, you know, there's some videos on YouTube. Or else this website, that's wrong. You're just perpetuating some myths. I think I'm going to stop there. Yeah, I am.